Now, uh, I want to ask you a question, or maybe it's a rhetorical one, um, which is in the documents that you received before you wrote your report and in the um, uh, comments that you received after you received the report, almost everyone made the point that AI was a separate subject uh, with goals of its own and uh, not intended to be a bridge between the other things. I would like to ask you, was it merely for tactical reasons that you chose to um, ignore that anyone was even making this contention? I'd like to answer that question. I think it's a very important question. Um, you see, in this country, there are a large number of first-rate computing science laboratories which have preferred not to call themselves AI laboratories, but have uh, concerned themselves with what Professor McCarthy calls the central area of his field, namely the study of problem-solving and goal-achieving uh, programs. And uh, these have been uh, tackled in their own right as fundamental computer science. Many of the points that uh, he's mentioned come in, for example, uh, search in the whole field of uh, information retrieval, uh, compiling, where our fine um, computer science laboratories have been much involved in producing advanced programming lang languages. Um, these, uh, I was, was uh, grouping with advanced automation for a very good reason, because uh, extremely often one, one finds that the uh, stimulus of a really important practical problem in automation um, is, is the thing that uh, causes solutions, new solutions to be found uh, to these questions and these add the rep it to the repertoire of what computer scientists can do. Now, uh, what are the arguments for not calling this computer science as I did in my talk and in my report and calling it artificial intelligence is because one wants to make some sort of analogy. One wants to, to bring in uh, what one can gain uh, by a study of how the brains of living creatures operate. This is the only possible reason for calling it artificial intelligence. Well, instead, see, excuse me. Uh, I invented the term artificial intelligence. I invented it because we had to do something when we were trying to get money for a summer study in, <laughs> uh, in 1956. And I had a previous bad experience. Um, the previous bad experience concerns occurred in 1952 when Claude Shannon and I decided to collect a, a batch of studies uh, which we hoped would contribute to launching this field. Uh, and Shannon thought that artificial intelligence was too flashy a term and uh, might uh, attract unfavorable notice. And so we agreed to call it automata studies. And I was terribly uh, disappointed when the papers we received were about automata. And uh, very few of them had anything to do with the goal that at least I was interested in. So I decided not to fly any false flags anymore. Uh, but to say that this is a uh, study aimed at the long-term goal of achieving human-level intelligence. Uh, since that time, many people have quarreled with the term, but have ended up using it. Um, Newell and Simon, the group at Carnegie Mellon University, tried to use complex information processing, which is certainly a very neutral term. But the trouble was that um, it didn't identify their field because everyone would say, well, I, my information is complex. I, I don't see what's special about you. Yes. Well, Newell and Simon, I think, are a good example of people who've moved a little bit towards the problem of, of, of trying to do psychology. They've been actually saying, how do human beings solve simple problems? And we all try to do a theory of this. And this is obviously a very desirable thing to do also. But I, I'm trying to suggest that we, we would uh, be much clearer in what uh, we, we attempt if when we are trying to do psychology and neurobiology, we think of ourselves as psychologists and neurobiologists and work with all the other guys in the field 
And uh, when we're trying to do advanced automation and computer science, we work with people like control engineers who, do, who developed an awful lot of experience of how to do uh, advanced automation well, and also with the key problem of how to actually get it into practice, all that business of humanely introducing it and so on that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. I, I think this is where we must ask Richard Gregory to come and help us because uh, he, 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 his research is in, in perception. Uh, to what extent has have the robot studies of uh, Mickey and McCarthy helped in this work, Richard? Well, I, th I want to say in that fact that it's a general concept which are coming out of artificial intelligence which are having an impact in psychology rather than the specific programs, for example, on neural nets, which you mentioned. Mm. And I go a little further than that. I may be exaggerating a little, but let me put the point. I think since behaviorism started in about 1900 and then Skinner and the stimulus response paradigm for psychology, Experimental psychologists, on the whole, were regarding human beings as examples of advanced automation, where you have a stimulus coming in, a response coming out, and there's a black box in the middle, and that's it. Now, what I think is becoming very apparent is that human beings are not at all like that, that we have a vast amount of data store inside us, that we have extremely noisy, often directly not relevant information available to us, that we make rather good on the whole decisions, we act extremely reliable, reliably, with poor input. Now, what's happened, I think, with the um, robot studies, and I think Donald was getting at this, is that we were all shocked and amazed how difficult it was because we were misled by the total inadequacy of psychological theory and the emphasis that was put on stimulus response. Now, what it's turning out, I think, is that the stimulus is not directly controlling behavior. It's rather calling up. Uh, generally speaking, and in normal situations, an appropriate internal model, map, hypothesis of the external world, and it's this that we act upon. So it's not stimulus response, it's rather a certain amount of rather grotty information, a hopefully adequate internal model, and then the response based on that, much as a hypothesis in science enables one to make a decision, but the hypothesis is the result of a great deal of past information and generalization which has been logically organized, and then the decision is made far more on what is internally represented than on what is available at that time, either available to the eye or to the telescope or to the microscope or to the uh, electrical instrument of, of an engineer. I think this is what's happened. So the emphasis on internal data and how it's organized logically is what's happening from the robot research. So I think to say that this is a business of models of neural nets is what we thought 10 years ago and it's what we very much moved away from now to sort of finish this a little bit the point about intelligence is this it exists because we're intelligent we have 10 to the 10 components in a box about the size of a football on top of our shoulders 10 to the 10 components is a lot but an awful lot of that is used up in vegetative functions like my tongue having to waggle about and this kind of thing in order to communicate. The actual number of neurons responsible for intelligence may be very, very much smaller than that. Uh, I see no reason why we cannot, in fact, make brains because they exist physically. When you say the brain is unique, you at one time said it's unique because it's big. You then made remarks that there are certain circuits in the brain which we can't replicate. Now, I would like to have an argument to show why this pessimism is justified. It seems to me pure pessimism or metaphysics. It's worse. It contradicts yeah. a mathematical theorem. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I didn't really expect that I would ever... Mm. Let Sir James answer. Well, uh, I mean, it's, uh, Professor Gregory seemed to uh, make two almost contradictory points. First, he said that neural nets don't matter. And finally, he said that they're, in the end, the thing we ought to be researching on most. Uh, I think he's been a bit unfair to experimental psychologists because uh, I think uh, they have been working on, um, on, on internal stores of, of information. They've been working on short-term memory and long-term memory and these things, and they've used computer models to, to find out the relation between these uh, different things. But, of course, I do agree with his statement uh, that... Uh, we have learnt a lot from the research in artificial intelligence, uh, essentially finding out how difficult it was. We were all shocked and amazed to find out how difficult it was, namely to extract information from uh, noisy pictures, from, from, um, from sense impressions of the real complex uh, world, and um, the evidence that we in fact do it by comparing with some sort of 
internal model, and this is a, a, a key feature that has come out of the work. Of course, it's um, arguing against the uh, ho uh, hopes for, art for um, general purpose robots because they would have to have such a very complicated internal model, uh, such a large internal universe of discourse that they'd be working um, with in order to identify uh, what they were seeing in the real world. But now I'll come to his last point where he comes back to neural networks. I mean, I pointed out that the difference between a, um, a, a, a current computer architecture, which by comparison with um, the cerebral cortex is, is, is a very simple architecture and all the complication is built into the program. I, I said that there's no reason to suppose that that type of architecture plus program can uh, begin to approach what the vastly more intricate networks of, ne of nerve cells inside human skulls can do. And of course, there's the a theorem mm, that says it can. Um, I, I, I don't think a theorem that says it can in a way that can be realized in a, in a time that is acceptable because of the difficulties of the combinatorial expression. I mean, the theorems with which Professor Mac for which Professor McCarthy is justly famous and Professor Robinson and others uh, have pointed out that problems can be, can be solved by algorithms, but the algorithms all involve enormous uh, lengths of time with any reasonably sized universe of discourse because of the combinatorial explosion. No, 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 you're, con mm -hmm. uh, you're could, confused. Could we have Richard Gregory, first of all, to see whether the, 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 this point has been answered about whether... But there's a mathematical whether, question uh, we might succeed yeah. in answering. Whether it. it is possible to construct a, an artificial brain. Well, first of all, I, I'd like to know in what sense you felt what I was saying was self-contradictory. I'm not saying one shouldn't study neural nets, but I think... I mean, you said the they were good thing ten years ago, but I mean, yes. in actual fact, there's been some quite good work on, on new ideas of, of how neural nets can achieve specific uh, tasks uh, in the last few years. Uh, I mean, it is an active field of research at the moment. Yes, I'd like to submit that perhaps the concept of restraints is important here, that mm. if you have a system which is following logical operations, it has to have has to have physical restraints corresponding to the logical steps required to produce the solution, whereas the network, such as Burl's work, was more on whether it's going to, so to speak, catch fire, run away with itself, this kind of thing, a very, very crude um, work. I mean, it was brilliant at that time, but now it looks terribly crude because it isn't mm. concerned with the state of the net for the specific problem. And it seems to me now the emphasis is on the logic of the problem. The next question will be how the physiology carries it out, but we haven't yet even begun to answer that question. Now, what the robot stuff is beginning mm. to that do it, when it's to show how it can be carried out with electronics. And this is a lead, I think, to how physiological research may go when the cognitive processes become respectable within physiology, which is only just happening. And the respectability, I think, is coming with the robot research. It's making the logical cognitive processes scientifically respectable. And this is a very great thing it's doing. Mr. James. For different uh, functions, I think the answer is, uh, is different. Uh, where, where it comes to simpler parts of the brain, like the cerebellum, uh, I think it is uh, already beginning to be possible to uh, identify the function of, of, of neural networks. Yes, I but I did feel that the cerebral cortex is, is, is incomparably more difficult. Uh, that's why we need the robot research, mm. this yeah. is my point. It's, it's extremely difficult. You are not saying that there is any fundamental reason why it's impossible. It's just extremely difficult. Well, uh, I, I do feel uh, that, uh, I mean, it, my uh, neurophysiologist friends tell me that contemplating the complexity of, of the extraordinary random appearance of the connection of all the nerve cells in the cerebral co cortex makes them feel that it is quite hopeless to attempt an right. analysis. Don, uh, yes, uh, Professor McCarthy, you wanted to say something earlier.